want to remind people the donation box to help pay for the electricity and the fans and um, taxes, things like that, is in the back on your way out. Um, Mark McDonald is unable to make it this evening due to a select board meeting that he needs to attend to in Williamstown. Um, His road is under fire. Jay? Yeah. Yeah, Make that part of your opening statement. Yeah, on fire. So, under fire. you should know Representatives Larry and Representatives Jay. I'm just doing first names. He's being very quick about this. And then Jim Miriam is going to moderate. So lightly. Lightly. Lightly moderate. I'm sorry. So, I'm so, this is really about you guys um, talking about highlights of the session or positions and a, a Q&A mostly or dialogue with the audience the way it's been done before. And, have a moderator to lightly moderate and hopefully should not have to do any moderating. Should someone try to dominate the conversation yep, or down the rabbit hole or ask too many questions, I will step in and take no offense. I'm going to say it right now. Right. That's, that's why he's here. All right. Thank, Thank you very you. much. So I'm Representative Jay Hooper. I, uh, I'm serving my fourth term in the House of Representatives. I serve on the House Committee on Government Operations uh, and Military Affairs. We were uh, privileged to take on the jurisdiction of half of another committee uh, as the Speaker rearranged the makeup of the committees. This session, I'm in my fourth term. Um, I'm pleased to continue to represent all of you in Brookfield and Roxbury, Granville, Randolph, and Braintree. Um, my committee took on quite a few issues this session. We, we were probably one of the more productive committees, uh, particularly in the way of addressing some of the specifics of uh, town requests throughout Vermont. Uh, when a, a town requests to, to change their charter uh, such that maybe they would allow for instance, 16-year-olds to vote in the town of Brattleboro on town elections only. Uh, not that would not include, you know, governor or anything uh, beyond. Uh, the legislature has to give permission to those towns. Uh, my philosophy always is that if a town and their voters, just like how Brookfield might uh, say, we. Uh, signal to the legislature that we would like this change. It would make no sense to me that the legislature would stand in the way of that request from that sort of immediate voting group. Um, among other things that government operations took up, elections reforms, bills, one uh, came from, uh, I don't know exactly where, but there were a couple uh, efforts to change the deadlines for registration for candidates and what it would look like, the, sort of the threshold to become a write-in candidate. Uh, we also took up uh, the concept of ranked choice voting. For anybody who's not familiar, that's basically being able to decide one, two, three, four, five, your favorite to your least favorite candidate. Everybody on the ballot gets, um, you, you get to vote for your preferences up and down. Uh, more recently, toward, so towards the end of the session, we, we took up a, a sort of a higher profile issue on the basis of immediacy because it came to light that the state's attorney in Franklin County was, has for quite a long time conducted sort of a, a negligent and uh, offensive workplace. Uh, John Lavoie, who had previously testified in my committee with considerable assertion uh, asking us to impeach the sheriff of Franklin County. He came out as maybe not exactly the guy that we want to be representing Franklin County in his capacity because of the things that he has said in the workplace over the last two decades and more. So now we've got a double uh, impeachment inquiry the state legislature hasn't since 1976 um, considered impeachment measures. Uh, now we are looking at two different individuals, both from Franklin County, uh, on a, 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 
There's a specific committee of seven lawmakers who are looking into that throughout the summer. They will uh, come back to the, to the legislature in January and make recommendations as to the various options that we, uh, we too and our colleagues can consider in the way of uh, action on impeachment. Sports betting, liquor and lottery, cannabis regulation, um, tweaks to the Office of Professional Regulation, all things Secretary of State. These are the things that my committee considers. Uh, but uh, aside from all this detail-oriented policy stuff, there are some more high-profile topics. Uh, the, the Affordable Heat Act was one of the things that we uh, championed this session as Democrats. That's my vote. That's yours. I'm not going to let Larry, I'm happy to let Larry take that one. Um, we have a housing crisis in Vermont, as you all know. Uh, the child care bill was vetoed. Uh, I think the governor vetoed a eight different bills or nine. I'm not sure the count was putting a number. I think it was a new record. It was, yeah. <laughs> he sets a new record. Yeah. So, uh, Jay Hooper, uh, happy to, to serve you all, and uh, thank you for being here tonight. And my name is Larry Sapkowitz, and we all live in a two-member representative district, so I serve along with Jay. Um, this is my second term. I serve on the Environment and Energy Committee. And in, um, in my committee this year, we um, tackled a number of um, really important bills. We passed quite a number of bills out of committee. It was a very productive session. Um, some of the more notable ones that we worked on this year were um, Let's uh, try and get all the numbers right. S100, which was the big housing bill. Um, my committee um, basically took half of that bill and, and, and worked on it, and that was the part that had to do with land use, because as an as, as a environment committee, we deal with regulations concerning land use, and the big ideas in that bill from our committee's perspective was about um, figuring out ways to make the state a little more friendly towards building more housing. Um, it was one of the things that we heard most clearly from voters all across Vermont was that the housing situation really is a crisis and that we need to make it easier and, as, as, and more affordable um, to build housing. And one of the tools that we have for doing that is through zoning. And, you know, most towns in Vermont have zoning, not all, but um, for the towns that do have zoning, um, the state is now telling those towns that there are certain things that you need to make sure that you do. There was a whole long list of them. Um, a couple of the more um, prominent ones were things like um, any place that you build a single family house where you have zoning where you can build a single family house, um, you also need to be able to permit a duplex to be built in such an area. Um, the other um, big set of ideas that this, that this bill did was to say, well, we want more housing, but we don't want it just anywhere. We don't want to make it easier for, to, for people to build houses just any place. We really want houses in places where there's already development, right, in our town centers, in what are called the, the designated areas. And so like Randolph, for instance, has a designated area in its downtown area. It's a, a designated downtown. Randolph also has an, 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 a designated neighborhood which surrounds that downtown. And so this bill also um, made changes to zoning that'll make it a little easier to build more dense and more affordable housing in those particular kinds of areas. Um, another bill that we worked on and passed was the Clean Heat Bill which was hugely controversial, and I suspect still is, and um, I suspect a bunch of you have, might have questions about it. That was the biggest question-generating bill that, that I worked on this year. I got lots of feedback on that, and that's something which I'd love to discuss further if, if people want to, because I know there was a lot of misinformation about that bill and a lot of just misunderstanding about the timing of it, what it's trying to accomplish, and how it's going to be doing that. But the big idea behind the bill is making Vermont a more affordable place to heat our homes and moving us through this transition that we are already underway, but to try and do it in a way 
which will help most people get through it in a way which makes economic sense. Mm -hmm. um, we also passed two bills which have to do with producer responsibility, which is sort of a, an, an emerging way of looking at our economy so that we tell the producers of various items, well, if you make something and you put it out into the world, your responsibility for that item doesn't end when someone buys it from you. And so we did that in two ways in, our, in this session. One was with the bottle bill, which is a producer responsibility bill. Um, we're basically telling, we do this now to a certain extent, but we're, we're going to be doing it in a more robust way um, in the future, assuming the bill can manage to get its way through the Senate. I wish Mark McDonald was here to talk about this, because he knows a lot more about where that bill is in the Senate right now. Um, but the idea is that, you know, uh, if you produce all these bottles, you have to figure out how to take them back and what to do with them. That's sort of the big idea. A lot more detail around that. It was a big, complicated bill. Um, and the other bill, which had to do with, with producer responsibility, was a household hazardous waste bill. And right now, you can bring your household hazardous waste to collection centers. Um, around here, there are um, you know, I think we do it with, there's a local district which is, includes Brookfield and Braintree and Randolph and Roxbury and Northfield called the Tri-Mountain Alliance. And the Tri-Mountain Alliance holds two collection events a year. I think one in Randolph and one in Northfield. And <clears throat> you can bring your items there and they get disposed of. And you don't pay anything to dispose of them at the collection site. But you pay for it indirectly through your municipal taxes and through your state taxes. Because it does cost a lot of money to get rid of these hazardous materials. And the way it is right now, producers can sort of let those things out into our environment. People can buy them. But then they don't have to do anything with them after that. What we're saying with this bill now, which was signed into law just recently, is that producers need to pay to get rid of this stuff. So it seems like that's a really good thing, you know, that it makes sense that the, that the people who are creating this stuff are going to pay for getting rid of this stuff instead of making people pay for it who have no role in producing it or using it or had anything to do with it. And um, I think there was one other bill I wanted to mention real quick. Oh, yeah. The other one which I wanted to mention, which actually was um, enacted into law, I think, just today, was the uh, 30 by 30 bill, which is a bill that um, directs the Agency of Natural Resources to do a planning. Um, their mission is to, is to plan a way so that we can have permanently protected, environmentally sensitive areas across the state of Vermont, 30% um, by 2030 and 50% by 2050. Now, most of Vermont is already forested, and due to the really wonderful efforts of, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of landowners who manage their lands in responsible ways, we have um, really remarkably robust ecosystems here. We're really lucky. Um, what this bill would do is it will help us maintain those ecosystems and all the benefits that they provide us um, long into the future by coming up with a plan to really make what we already have now in place, which is sort of an atten tentative basis, to make it a lot more permanent. So that our children, my children, my grandchildren, people who will be here dozens, hundreds of years from now, will be able to look out on our landscape and see a world and a functioning ecosystem um, which is much like what we have today, and not see the sorts of development that you see in other places. Um, if you travel just not far from here, right all across New England, um, you, it's very easy to find places where um, there's development. And all the nooks and crannies and the, and the sort of more wild places have, have really greatly diminished. And um, so this, this bill will help us keep those places intact. And correct me if I'm wrong, Larry, but this bill, the 30 for 30 bill, uh, 30 by 30 bill, is essential to connecting. Vermont has a corridor forest-wise that would connect the various other parts of New England that are doing this effort. And in order to make those efforts maximal, this bill 
is important. So like we're connecting other states and their efforts to do so. By right, no, that's, that's true. There's from the, the wildlands in Vermont, um, our, our corridors for animals to travel and plants and other, and, and, and other kinds of um, organisms as well between Maine and the National Forest there and New Hampshire and then in New York and the Adirondacks is a, the Adirondacks State Park is a huge natural area and then there's large forests protected and unprotected north of us too in, in Canada and we're right in the middle of all that. So both of our committees have taken on quite a lot um, in the way of sheriff reform and environmental issues. Uh, we are both sitting on fairly statusy committees. They're not money committees. Typically in the legislature, you, that those who serve on the committees that decide what, what it looks like Vermont to collect revenue versus how Vermont appropriates dollars to state interests and public entities, those are where the more powerful politicians sit. We're on committees that aren't, aren't very low on that you know, the list of cloutful committees, I suppose. What do we do now, Jim? We're, right. If you both are ready, we're ready. Oh, we're ready. And I'll let you pick the names, and I'm only going to jump in. Okay. I mean, their hands. Sure. I'm only going to jump in if it seems like somebody's coming. So you guys look good and don't have to shut somebody down. Okay. I'm here for you. Uh, thank you. Here for you. Who's first? Anybody? Kevin? I know you can. Yeah. Well, I have lots of questions. But I'll just ask you two based on what you just described. Mm -hmm. the other one raising the water. Um, I know that, Larry, you talked about um, encouraging home building, which is a big issue. But homelessness now as well in designated areas. And it said we wanted to increase density in areas that are so designated, but also make them more affordable. And I know that Jay just said you're not really in the economic forum, but did the community discuss means by which we could look at housing for people? Because that's something I've heard a lot of all this as well as you folks, and people, especially young and people with less means, are having really struggled to find housing. Yeah, no, yeah, no, thank you for that question. Um, a big portion of S100 had to do with specifically um, allocating money for affordable housing. Um, and the zoning part that my committee dealt with, um, the, 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 that part of the bill, um, Basically, it mandates designated areas to be able to 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 allow various kinds of affordable housing, and it allows affordable housing to be um, denser than other types of housing. Um, and the reason why that that like for example, one of the provisions this is getting kind of in the weeds, but it'll give you a sort of a flavor of the kinds of things that we discussed. Um, if you're putting up a, an affordable, a, a, like a multi-unit building that has affordable housing in it that meets certain criteria, um, that kind of a building is allowed to build one extra story over what would otherwise be allowed by the local zoning. Um, and the idea behind allowing that is that, you know, when you're already getting the site ready, while you're already putting in the foundation, sometimes getting that extra floor in is what makes a project economically viable or not. And so the idea is that by doing things like that, you're, we're able to create opportunities which might not have existed otherwise. Yeah. I want to follow up on that question. I'm, um, I'm on the Brookfield Planning Commission. We had a little uh, sort of uh, answer, question and answer session here a couple of uh, weeks ago. And it seems like one of the biggest issues um, as far as housing goes that we're running into is we can change zoning, we can change is septic in Vermont. And right now our septic laws are still pretty archaic. You know, they don't, there's no allowability of, of gray water systems. Maine and New Hampshire allow gray water. And especially with this new movement of like smaller ADUs, small houses, that's the way to really tackle some of the affordability side of it to where if somebody is in a two, three, four, 200, 300 square foot um, tiny house and they have and they can put in a gray water system and use a composting, composting toilet, that is gonna help with the affordability, it's gonna help get some housing out there, you know, because we all know building costs are massive. We can't you can't do anything about it as a state legislator, we can't do anything about it. But it's like I feel like if on the planning commission in Brookfield and in the state, if we can do certain things to get out of people's way. And I you know I understand is important, but you know the gray water thing really is for me is a tough one to stomach that 
There's no allowed in. If you don't put in a, a licensed septic, you're a camp, and depending on what town you're in, you've got 100 days. Right. So and I know that's neither of your committees, but I think that's definitely something that, that the state should look at, re, you know, rethinking the, you know, what our, you know, our wastewater uh, look like, especially for towns like Brookfield that do not have a public wastewater system. Um, and, there's, um, and we're not like, we're just, the, we're not the few, we're like sort of more the norm in Vermont, not having, you know, water, you know, public water, public wastewater. Yeah. You know, so all of this great climate, all this great, you know, sort of, ideas behind rebuilding and repurposing old buildings, downtown areas. So much of it around the country focuses around areas that have public water and waste. Yeah. So yeah, no, they, your point your point is well taken. And um, I've, I've I've often wondered why it is like that in Vermont. And I don't I don't know the answer, but you're right. We our our rules are more well let's let's call them less creative than less some other places. Um, that, that are that, that are more that are more permissive um, with and I, and I don't know what the downside is it seems like there are alternative systems which work perfectly fine but we don't allow them to move on do you have my wife that stay she's back gardening and she works in the NR, I think she yeah I would talk to her so what do you think is there a specific obstacle with gray water uh, that makes it a camp versus a well, there's just, you, you cannot, there's, there's, you can't, there's no approved, you, you have to have an approved state septic design, which is mound system, or if you don't perk, or it perks, you can't have gray water. You just can't, you know. You know, and, and, septic, that's 30, 30, 000, 30, 000. You know we got, you know, you know, you, you, you know, and we as a town, we can't change that. So we can't say, you can, you, you can have this, right. you can have this ADU on your property, you know, if it doesn't tie into your septic and your septic can handle it, you can't do it. Uh -huh. Or, and like I said, you know, especially because there's this big movement on the tiny house thing. Yeah, and it's like, and not to be that, not to be too combat, not, it's like, okay, so if I had a 400 square foot small house with a composting toilet and a gray water system for one individual, um, and, you know, am I gonna have that, am I gonna have a bacterial load going through my gray water system more than one cow doing its thing daily? You know, and it's like, and, and, and the answer is no. I think there should be safeguards, it shouldn't be like, you have your you, you have your gray water system right next to you know, in, in a, like a body of water or stuff like that. But it, it, it's taking a lot of buildable land and money out of the uh, system. Yeah. As she said, it's a huge. Go to your committee meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Jack. You know, as long as you guys brought up the poop situation, <laughs> I got I got to get this off my chest. You can't have, you can't put a, a, a trailer on a piece of property and just dig a hole and use that as your septic to get in trouble for it. But yet, septic cleaning companies, and this is already happening here in Brookfield. Trust me, I know. Mm -hmm. They clean out a septic over in Barry, and they bring the stuff over here and they spread it on fields untreated. Really? Yes. Human waste. And all you need is to get a license from the town. So what these gentlemen are saying, we have these rules, right? People are made to do all kinds of stuff, jump through hoops and everything else. And yet we can take and put human sewage with all kinds of pathogens and everything else into a field. <clears throat> and Lord knows whether it grows corn or, or, or grass for cows or one of these trails that I heard a lady talking about before sure. walking through and taking care of. The laws around here, your Department of Environmental Protection, when I complained to them about some the situation, they told me they couldn't handle it because they were too busy. But yet they go on the news, on TV, and they tell you about composting. And they talk about other stuff. What does our Department of Environmental Protection do? They're a big office. But they can't seem to take and get the right regulations out there to go after the stuff that makes the place look like hell. Sure. Yeah, we have. And even though it's not your purpose, right, right. Man, but you're in. You're both of you are in positions to buttonhole people that can do something. Can I ask you a question, Jack? Go right ahead. Do you, are you familiar with humanure and the concepts that some of the proponents of allowing, I guess, being able to dig a hole and just 
Jay, think about it. A, a, a septic is a septic is a septic. Right, right. It's a hole in the ground. You have a holding tank with the solids. You have liquid coming out, and it spreads out through the ground. Mm -hmm. In this state, they push like crazy for, for what they call a, a field or a bed mm -hmm. with, the, with the pipes that go out. Those things cost fortunes. The lady back here, right. I was told, they cost twenty, thirty thousand dollars. I spent my life in construction. They don't cost that kind of money. The contractors screw you every time they put money well, you in. You came from New Jersey, right? Yes, I did. I'm proud of it. Sorry, folks. But and by the way, don't let this damn state look like New Jersey, please. <laughs> we'll stop to it. But the point I'm trying to make is, we pass this law and that law and everything else, and you look around at some of the laws that we've got, and like you said, they are archaic. They're ridiculous. Mm -hmm. There's no reason why you can't put a small septic system in the ground next to a trailer. Sure. We all have them. I've got one. I don't even know where it is. And I'm going to be shortly digging around to find it. You know? Uh, but we got to do something. We've got to change something. We've got to get to the, uh, the agencies that are controlling the lives of people and, and make them do the job they should be doing and not let them spread waste sure. on fields. Sure. You know, every, I, I'll go on for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to cut you off in 30 seconds. <laughs> You're doing all right? The people in the north, especially up in Chittenden County, they love to attack the farmers from right. manure and the phosphate and this and that. No one has bothered to look at the fact that the problem with Lake Champlain is really not the farmers, because every year the farmer numbers go down and the population goes up. And where do you think all that effluent and stuff is going? Into the ground, and if you check the, 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 the soils and stuff, I'm not a, a geologist, but I would love to know which way all the water goes. And it's all towards Lake Champlain. So all the new houses on septic are sending their stuff into the lake. But yet everybody blames the farmer. Right. I, like, please, shut me up. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I think Emily had a question behind. Yeah, to loop back to the yeah. <laughs> So, and like something we were talking about, I've lived tiny in multiple different states and all that. Vermont has really weird rules. And what he's saying, and like the point of, if you don't have the septic, then you're considered a camp. So then you can only live there six months a year. And that's where it's an issue that, okay, so then the other six months of the year, I either maybe could get kicked out of my land, get in trouble. And like in Pennsylvania, and this is a legal thing in Pennsylvania, we were allowed to run our gray water. And we had a whole system for it. We had a neighbor try to say we were putting poop in it. We had our land tested, all of that, dirt samples. We had some of the best dirt samples he said he's seen. Like, it was no issue, all compostable products. Mm -hmm. But then for our waste, and I know like we're not cooked, it's a lot of sewage and stuff, like, or not public water and septic. Like, Pennsylvania, you're allowed to have, like, a water potty company come to your house and empty out And that's legal, but to do that here, it would make you considered a camp. But in Pennsylvania, right. you would be considered a right. camp. Yeah, that's, that's so, like, that's something you even look at. Like, Vermont maybe puts in a, some sort of way to take care of the waste and something, so then people aren't having to be that septic and are able to get that. Because even if you have a camper, you can't dump it here past October at any public dumping station. That's, that's very um, good. I, I went camping here one October. I came up back to my country. Then in October, I <laughs> we were frantic. Really? We were like, we're full guys, like we yeah. gotta find. We had to drive to New Hampshire to find them. Like literally, it was like Burlington the whole way down. Totally. Like it's a difficult because it free I think like freezing. Are you now. aware you can do that in Randolph Center? But can you do it past October? Not too far past October 15th. Yeah, so like that sounded like, I don't know, car or something like that, and moving tiny homes that time of year is harder. So it's like work during the summer. But then during the winter, it's where mm -hmm. people are facing you. Good enough. That's very good enough. Yeah. Anybody else on septic manure? No, it's not me, but I've texted out to the employee <laughs> okay. that I know. Yeah, I know let's hear it. Let's scoop it, because I thought these were great questions. Great. Really well, really well. Not all houses need mounds, as it depends on the soil type. Vermont treats great water as black water due to human germs in it. Yes, Vermont is different than Maine and New Hampshire. The gentleman with the complaint about spreading should call Carl Fuller of DEC, Gary and Brookfield are in his jurisdiction, or call the DEC complaint line. 
But read, mountains are very expensive, and she's still typing. <laughs> but that sucks. Carl Fuller, Jack, you got a phone number for him? I guess you call the PDC complaint. Yeah, the next time I take in contact. No, you don't want to deal with it. It's not like you're going to win with a <laughs> Should we, uh, more questions? Yeah. Tell us about the unaffordable heat act, where that came from, and how come you're pushing it so Sure. So there's been a whole, whole bunch of things that have been said about the, of the, the, the Clean Heat Act. And um, I, I want to sort of push back on some of the things of which I've heard over the last several months. Um, one is that it's going to raise the price of oil and propane like starting now, and the bill does not go into effect until 2025. If that's, if it does go into effect, right? Because the before the bill goes into effect, I shouldn't say it that way. The bill, the bill was passed, the, the, the was veto, and the veto was overridden. So the bill did go into effect. But what the bill does, the bill that we passed, is it creates s a, a study group. And it creates the ability for the PUC to create regulations for how this will all work. And then, in 2025, when the new legislature takes an effect, we will come back and we will look at what those studies tell us. And we'll look at the regulations which are proposed. And then we will see, OK, is this something that we want to go forward on? So between now and 2025, nothing is going to change from a consumer point of view. No one's heating bill is going to be changed by this legislation in the next two years. You just said the price was going up. No, we didn't. No. So that's fear. That was that. That's what we heard. Is that people are saying, you know, your your bills are going to increase starting now, as soon as this thing gets passed. And that is simply not true. So Larry, yeah. answer this. If you are now hiring three people or whoever designated on this committee, why not do that preliminary for doing this kind of act to pass? Well, that's because, because that gets the homework done. Yeah, because because we're, that's price. that's what we're doing is we're doing we're doing the homework. It's just that. It's just that the homework is very involved. And it's, it's quite complicated, and it requires setting up a whole set of regulations and finding out all the information that, that we need to find out in order to figure out exactly how those regulations, what they need to look like. And so what the bill really does is it appropriates money to hire people to stand this stuff up so that we can then take a look at it and say, OK, does this really make sense? And then in 2025, we'll come back and we'll look, look at this all over again. And then we're, that's when we really are going to decide whether we want to move forward with the program that is envisioned by S5. Now tell us the uh, vision that you have for this. So, so, the, so the vision is that there, there will be, um, it will set up an energy credit system. And we already have energy credit systems in Vermont. We have one through, through um, the, the utility, the, the electric utilities, it's been in effect for a very long time. This system would be different than that, but it's the same basic idea. And what it will do is it will add a cost. It's not like this will be free. There will definitely be a cost to this. That cost is unknown right now. This is one of the other things which we heard a lot about was the cost is going to be really large. We heard of 70 cents a gallon. We heard much higher numbers. Um, those, those numbers are not based in reality. Um, the closest um, program that exists, which would be similar to the one that is envisioned by S5, is a program in Oregon, which has to do with automotive fuels there. And they saw increases in certain fuels on the order of 5 to 15 cents a gallon, something in that neighborhood. A far cry from the 70 plus cents a gallon that we've been hearing um, people who, who are against this legislation um, who are really putting those numbers out there to scare people. So we, are, we, are, we do expect it to cost something, but we expect those costs to be affordable. And 
what, 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 what we never heard from the folks who were against this bill, they would always talk about the costs, but they never talked about the benefits. Right now, we live in a world where heating fuels are very, very expensive, and they contribute to polluting our atmosphere. And we're reliant on them. And the money that we spend on them, most of it goes right out of state. We want to move towards a future where we're burning a lot less of this stuff, keeping the money here, and having the cost be lower all at the same time. It involves making a transition. Now, the transition is already happening. Whether Vermont but likes it or not. Well, but what is happening in Vermont, it is happening in Vermont. But the way in which it's happening in Vermont is that people who can afford to transition are doing it. So as you look around and you see people putting solar panels up on their roofs, well, who's doing that? People who can afford to put solar panels on the roof. You, and if you wander around, well, Randolph Village, I see it around, really. I live in Randolph Village, and I see this as I wander around. Heat pumps are popping up all over the place. If you pay attention, you see them happening. But they're not cheap. They make economic sense. They pay for themselves. But not everybody has the money up front to make it happen. And so what this bill will do is this energy credit system will take that money, those energy credits, the, the money that's generated by those credits, and they're going to help folks of lower and moderate income, the folks we think of as kind of like ordinary Vermonters, and it's going to help put incentive programs in place so that when you say to yourself, well, my house is a really good candidate for a heat pump. Now, not all homes, heat pumps aren't a great solution for all homes. That, that is very clear. There are some people who are saying, well, they're going to make everybody have heat pumps. That is completely not true. Only, only a fraction, a large fraction, but only a fraction of homes make sense for having a heat pump. But anyway, I want to go back to this idea that let's say you have a house in which a heat pump makes sense, but you don't have the money to get started, to save yourself money in the long run, right? This bill is going to help you or people in that situation make that transition. Okay, That's one of the things that it's going to do. Um, and, I, and I think it's really important that we, that we do that. And to be clear, the bill started with this philosophy and sort of was diminished to something that uh, wouldn't possibly take effect until another legislature is elected. So 2025 is the earliest time by which we could adopt any of the suggestions that the study committee comes up with in the way of understanding the details and projections of a transitional marketplace that Vermont just will not impact energy-wise. This is a, a marketplace that is huge, huge. And Vermont just doesn't have a, any influence on it, aside from understanding it as well as we can. And why would we not want to do that? So that's why we passed that one. Koto? What is the role of the PUC when they charge with? And then my follow-up would be, what if the legislature disagrees with or, you know, let's we'll start with that. Okay. Then I kind of have oversight of the PUC. Sure. Yeah. Um, the, in, in the bill, there is um, a few different spots along the way that as they're doing their work, they're going to be checking back in with us even before January 2025 when the deadline is for them to submit their final, um, their final plan. Which is about what? How? Which is the final plan? The final plan is, is basically the, the regulations that will be put in place to set up this energy credit market and the associated government apparatus that, that needs to make it all work. And what if the PUC says, we want to run more power lines from Hydro Quebec because we consider that a renewable resource, even though it's not um, indigenous land? Yeah. This bill is pretty specific in terms of what they're, what they're being asked to do. So okay. it's, it's very much related to helping us move um, our home heating thermal sector, you know, away from oil and propane. Right, but that, 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 that's just, I guess, my problem is the PUC is supportive of hydro and would be supportive of probably 
bringing in right. more and saying it was renewable. And I'm not saying My, that because I don't Yeah, no, I hear what you're saying. Don't you well, Using, using, um, it, it's really, it's really about what kind of fuel you're going to use. And so the, the bill is really all about, um, moving us towards, it is moving us towards using electricity because the heat pumps are, are, use electricity. But the, the, this, this bill doesn't talk about where that energy then comes from. That's a separate issue, which, which, which we, which, which is an ongoing conversation, and, and that's another piece of we, we, my committee is going to be talking about that piece of it next year in the second part of the session, where we're going to be talking about what our renewable energy standards are going to be because those have we have renewable energy standards in Vermont right now that require us to do certain things with how we source our electricity. Um, they need to be updated there. They haven't been updated in a long time. That's uh, one of the big issues that we're going to tackle in the second half of, of the term. So my hope is, as Ver states like Vermont, New Hampshire, Maine, create climate councils, committees like Larry's will figure out ways to bridge the distance between those councils so that there's a, a uniform effort regionally to consider these questions. So two things. You mentioned about the, the heat pump. Yeah, we know that um, in certain towns, they don't work on uh, when it gets really cold. Exactly. They have a real problem. They uh, we have cold winters. I mean, it got 25, 30 below this winter several times. Heat pumps don't work. That's one issue. And then what about those houses you mentioned? Oh, we can get some houses for heat pump. What about the other houses? You say too bad to them. Mm -hmm. Well, goodbye. Yeah. That's it. You make it in your mind. And you say this is what we have to do, but then you don't have a recourse. And I want to ask both of you and all of the legislature mm -hmm. and all of Vermont, with all this uh, push, 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 uh, Nikola Tesla had free energy over 100 years ago. Uh, any of you familiar with that at all? Is anyone looking into a feasible? reality of where the electricity is coming from before you push all the EVs and before you push these lithium batteries that also are null and void in cold temperature just like the so to answer so your yeah, you have, you yeah, so and recycling and do you know where all those lithium batteries come from have you seen the waste that it creates in the earth and who's producing them the kids that are in those mines you guys are so environmentally happy, but you want to push, 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 but don't do the background until you say, oh, yeah, keep doing it, keep doing it. Oh, now what? Now we have to create a new law. You guys are just creating laws upon laws upon laws. Well, I think to answer your, your last fundamental question about electricity versus other fossil fuels and sort of whether we're blindfolded to the to the future or to the current you know the status of what that production looks like we certainly aren't and the people i know larry and his colleagues in that committee definitely consider those things with tied hands almost um, i would say electricity has upward mobility petroleum does not um, so these are things that we have to figure out ways to solve as we go um, and in the meantime, we have to create policy that encourages green energy. Green energy is far more electric than it is, you know, tar sands. So if, it, yeah, but to go, and to go, to, you know, peat, peat pumps, I, I'm kind of not hugely persuaded on heat pumps either, but I've heard too many if, people who have them and they're useless. When it comes to state dollars and climate resiliency, Weatherization is the best bang for our buck. If we can button up the houses in Vermont, we have an old housing stock in this state, and a lot of the people who own those houses can't really afford it. When the Yankee got closed and all that money was supposedly going back to the ratepayers that paid into sure. it, and it didn't happen, and the legislature decided it was going to use it for weatherization, what ever happened? Why aren't these houses now in a better position than they were before that? I mean, I don't see that. It's just a little. Yeah, so you brought up some really great points, and I'd like to respond to some of them. Yeah. 
So in terms of heat, do heat pumps work, they absolutely work. And the reason I know that they work is because I have a heat pump in my 1890 Queen Anne Victorian for the last eight years. And we have gone from burning over a thousand gallons of oil a year to burning plus or minus a hundred gallons of oil a year. Um, our heat pump almost completely heats our house. Wait, 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 stop, excuse me. You're still burning oil which means you're not getting your heat totally from the heat pump. Well, that isn't the point. Most, let me, no, let me respond. Yeah. Yeah. Most. Yeah, yeah. yeah you respond. Uh, <laughs> so, because what I really want to respond to is this idea that heat pumps are ineffective in our climate. And it, it isn't, it just isn't true. The heat pump that I purchased eight years ago um, is now old technology. The heat pumps that come out now work even better at even lower temperatures and do a more efficient job of pulling hot air out of cold air than the heat pump that I have. The heat pump that I put in my house eight years ago has more than paid for itself in the time that I've been Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, how, during the period of time now that all the rules and regulations are going to be developed, to uh, set the stage for the uh, legislature in 20, uh, 2025. Uh, how has the committee uh, envisioned what's going to be happening, happening to the current energy supply community and businesses in the state? Because I, I, what I do know is on the corner of my home, of West Street and Cross the Road, I see an awful lot of oil trucks going back and forth, back and forth, all over the uh, all over the area, and, or or in my case, propane trucks. Um, how do you understand that the energy supply companies that we now rely upon yeah. are going to be able to cope with the transition? because of what the kind of business they have. Yeah, 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 no, thank you for that question. We heard a lot of testimony from the fuel dealers who are gonna be sort of the, the sort of on the front lines right. in terms of being affected by, by this legislation. And um, what we heard was um, all from sort of all across the spectrum, from people on one end saying, this is horrible, it's gonna kill us, we can't do this, please, please, please don't do this, to companies on the other end who are saying, we're already doing everything you want us to do, um, and, 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 and in between. The reality is that the change which we're asking the fuel dealers to go through, um, we're just asking them to do it faster than they would have otherwise. They're gonna have to do this to one extent or another. Um, I, I suppose, you know, I'm sort of veering off, off a little bit here, but one of the things to keep in mind here is that this, the, the, the program that we're gonna set up it's going to be until 2050. So, you know, nothing's going to happen overnight. It's not like there's going to be like, on, it's not like the day that the bill gets passed, all of a sudden, everything's going to change. It's, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be gradual. You know, people are going to change their fuel systems, their heating systems, over time when they can. The idea really is not that you just take your existing system and you toss it in the garbage. The idea is that at some point you decide that it makes sense to get a, to get a new one. Like in, in my case, in my home, you know, we already had a perfectly good oil-based system. And for those really cold nights, like you're saying, we're not completely off oil. On those really cold nights when it's minus 25 and we can't, and our heat pump can't keep up with the heating demands of the house, yeah, we turn our boiler on. But we're using 90% less oil than we used to. Like, it's a world of difference. Imagine if all, if all across the state, everybody used 90% less oil. The amount of money that would stay in our economy here would be hundreds of millions of dollars greater. It would be an economic boon to people living here, now, you know, in, in, in our communities. This is a really, this is a really good thing. I mean, there's all sorts of good reasons to, to get off fossil fuels. But if, if all you're interested in is the bottom line, just the economics of it, it's a no-brainer. It's in our economic self-interest to stop sending money out of state on these very expensive fuels whose prices we can't control 
to a system where we keep more of the money in our state, in a regulated system, like the electricity system, where the prices are much more stable and we can control them. It's a very different world. Think about all the people, well, I mean, again, I'm a good example. This past year, if I had, if I had not had a heat pump, I would have spent an additional, well, I used to burn over, I used to burn a thousand gallons more than I do now. Heating prices went up two dollars ish a gallon, right? I saved two thousand dollars in one year. That's half the price almost I spent on the heat pump eight years ago. Like, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could make that available to more people? Like, I am so much better off because I heat myself with this more efficient, economically regulated product than if I had stayed on the world marketplace for fossil fuels. Yeah, you've had your hand up for a while. I'm super, super excited about heat pumps. Can't wait to get one. And we put it on because um, we, the Inflation Reduction Act supposedly set aside a big hunk of money. And it was yeah. summer 2023 that the states were going to get control of that money to disperse it for these things. Is that something so that you... My uh, understanding is that you can apply uh, that this year that money goes into effect and you can get that money as a tax credit from the federal government. You don't need to wait around for Vermont. Oh, you don't? But one of the really nice things about this bill, about S5, and I want to tell you, I was very skeptical about the clean heat bill when it came in front of my committee. When we first started hearing testimony, I was like, oh my gosh, this is really not a great idea. We're already doing all this. The Inflation Reduction Act, it's already happening. Why do we need to do this thing on top of all this stuff which is already happening? But what was really made clear to me and which really made me a big fan is this idea that the Inflation Reduction Act, the amount of money that's involved, while very significant, is still not enough for people, especially at the bottom half of the economic spectrum, to easily make the transition. But when you combine the federal incentives with the incentives that we expect to be able to generate through the implementation in 2025 of S5, the, whatever that new bill is actually, we'll be able to leverage so much more money. We'll be able to really help people go from not being able to do it at all to being able to do it in a way which really makes sense to them. And it's really very exciting. Quick question. When you put that new pump in, how much did your electricity go up? It went, it went up a lot because heating requires a lot of electricity. Oh, but the electricity, the electricity on a per BTU basis, that you, the, the heat that you generate on a per BTU basis through a heat pump costs far less than doing it through oil. Like I said, I saved $2,000 last year because my electric cost didn't go up, but my heating bill would have by $2,000 if I had stayed on oil. And when you say you're so happy, you this money in-house. We have powers from Canada. What are you talking about? Yeah. Huh? What's that? That's a good question. I don't, I don't, yeah. That's, that's, that's a good question. I, I don't have the details off the top of my head. But when you do, but when you do, when you do the analysis, a much greater percentage of the money that we spend on electricity stays in Vermont than if you spend it on fossil fuels. Moderator. I will, I will, uh, Put a plug in for Larry that once the res reform bill goes through, 30% of the power would be local if that was the case. 30%, 30% in Vermont. Where? Wind, solar. Wind that we don't want the things up on our hills. Some of us don't want Some solar with bathrooms <laughs> stuff that we can't get rid of because there's no way to recycle it. I'm not going to get into the debate on that. Well, the, 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 the point is, is that we can procure local. Is, is the point. It, it, and you can't get oil locally. You're not going to get fossil fuels locally. But my question is around S5. And it's about workforce training and development. So the, the one concern I have, or I have lots of concerns, but one concern I'll point out is on S5 for putting this bill into effect, we have a shortage of contractors. And perhaps you saw the, like the Digger article, or actually 
El Car, the legislative committee and administrative rules just delay implementing the new the new efficiency building code yep. because we don't have enough people to implement it. <clears throat> is there something in S five that is actually going at you know you could pass the most tremendous bill, but if we don't actually have the people to do the work, it's gonna be stifled. And so I'm curious yeah. to see and within S five, is there a workforce development? Function. There, there's not a, work, a specific workforce development in S5, um, but the, in terms of um, the, the mechanical stuff, like installing heat pumps, we're actually fairly close to being able to meet the demand for that now. Um, the installers have been hiring people pretty rapidly in that field. The place where we're going to have the big challenge is weatherization. And that's the part which Jay alluded to, but I didn't get a chance to say yet, is that um, for folks who maybe a heat pump doesn't work for their household, um, but they have old windows, they have no insulation in their walls, we have lots of those houses. I think it's 90,000 homes in Vermont are still in need of major weatherization. And getting that done is going to be our big workforce challenge. Um, but it'll create and, jobs. It, it's it's gonna it's gonna create jobs, but it's the other thing to keep in mind is it's not gonna happen overnight. The, you know the, the bill brings us out to 2050, so <coughs> nobody expects all these homes to get weatherized in the next five years or ten years. It's 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 a it's a generational product. And it's project. Plug in, and I'll go back. And then <coughs> quite a while. There are though pockets within the state. If you go to southern Vermont, particularly like Bennington County and in that area, there's not enough contractors to do right. heat pumps even True. at a low rate. It's and, crazy. Wow. And so it's going to be for it to be a statewide implementation versus you know oriented towards more of the uh, population centers. We really do have to think about how we make sure that rural areas don't get left behind in the transition because of insufficient workforce. It's far cheaper to go house to house to house in Chittenden County than it is to drive for three hours between your visits in Southern Vermont. So that's my, my plug. Right. It doesn't do and my comments are two seconds because exactly what you're saying though, if all of these trades people, blue collar people, people who can do this work, if we don't fix housing, they can't live here, they can't be here. Absolutely. So, you know, you know and think about what's Vermont gonna look like in 50 years. You know, my, my, my kids, 21 and 20 and 23 now, neither of them think they can stay and live in the state. They, just, like, they don't even think they could ever own a home. And it's not just Vermont, but it's a big, a big thing. But you're not going to have somebody to drive your fuel truck or your the installer to uh, install your heat pump. Um, if you go down to Central Supply to buy a two by four to go out to eat, you can have all of these big expensive houses and all that. But if you don't have a place, and I'm in the hospitality industry, if you don't have a place where you know working class people can afford to live, you don't have a society. Mm -hmm. Housing. It all comes you don't, you don't get no argument from me. I agree with you completely. Emily. Emily. Would you? Uh, yeah, I have a few. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, one. To just continue that, then I want to go back. Are we looking into? Okay, so if you're short, you're saying you want less oil, so that means obviously there's going to be less jobs for the oil company because less people are going to be needing oil. Are we looking into taking those companies, offering them incentives to say, hey, now do you want to learn how to install heat pumps, and do you want to learn how to do weatherization? Do you have workers for that? That's just a question, like sure. are we looking into anything like that where we have these companies that if they would suffer, I'm not in favor of a lot of what I'm hearing, but this is just a question sure. for if it does go through. And then, so I moved from Asheville because it was this great green mecca and it became a human wasteland. Our river now has eight times the amount of E. coli in our river. Oh, wow. And then everybody in Asheville did this big push like we're doing right now. So. They wanted us all to go electric and instead of pushing biofuel. I've not heard anything about biofuels, which shocks me. I mean, we have all this poop issue. Guess we can make biofuels out of poop. And Vermont can make that in-house. You could have farms make that in-house. You can store it. There's tons of things with biofuel. We're not looking into it. You can take oil systems and convert them very easily to take biofuel. So in Asheville, then, we get all this to go towards electric. 
Remember, it provides electric for actual Duke Energy. You know how Duke Energy gets electric? Coal, burning coal. And they tried to stop that a bunch of times. They kept saying, we're putting different regulations, we're doing this. Guess who has more money than civilians that want green energy? Coal and petroleum industry and stuff. So I'm just concerned we're going to go so green and then go electric. So I heard hydro, one of them, where it's going to go through native lands. And then nuclear, which I'm not against. Like, there are pluses and negatives to all of this. But I'm just concerned that we have so much focus on electric. What if our power grid shut down or something? Like, you can deliver heating oil when your power goes out. If you're relying on electric when your power goes out to run your supply of heating, you can freeze to death. And that's an actual thing that can happen in Vermont. Yeah, no, you're right. And, and, and the energy credit market will also apply to biofuels and... and Are we leaning and, towards that and in a big way? It's, it's, it's in the bill. The, one of the things which is really nice about this bill is that it's really, it's technology neutral. So it actually doesn't really matter what your technology is. If it has a lower carbon footprint than, than oil and than gas, it's gonna be supported by this bill to one extent or another. And so right now, the technology that we have, which is the most effective for most people is electricity powered heat pumps. Not gonna work for everybody. So the bill, but the bill doesn't mandate heat pumps. The bill doesn't mandate any particular kind of fuel or heating source. What, it, what the bill will do is it says, if you can meet you know, the, the needs in a less carbon intensive way, then you get credit for that. And so if you can do it through biofuels or you can do it through wood heat, then that works also. Okay, now, and excuse my ignorance because I'm new to the area, but I, this is something. No, this, I, this is a big complicated issue. Oh, totally. <clears throat> and so I guess what I'm trying to wonder, like with the biofuel, is there an infrastructure then to support this? Like, does, is Vermont looking into how to supply biofuels in house? Like, if you're saying that is something we're looking into, like, I just know naturally one husband. Yeah, so, yeah. My this... husband makes biofuels. So, like, he was trained, he did a class with Plenty International, a group that does green energy work all around the world and stuff. And he learned to make it in, on, like, the docks in Philly with this dude that was, like, one of the top biofuel engineers. I mean, it's not hard. Like, and that's why, like, that's something we could be, like, I feel like really focusing yeah. on. Investing in that. So, there's, there's two ways that, that biofuels um, enter the picture here in Vermont. One is um, in the Chittenden County area where they already have natural, natural gas pipelines. And so it's relatively easy for them to add a, a, you know, a, a biofuel gas into that pipeline. So using its, you know, existing infrastructure. Um, and the other way is through the fuel dealers, who are, many of whom are already delivering biofuels or biofuel mixes with their heating oil. And so, People who do that kind of work will be able to get credit for it. That's a great question. Lots of great questions. Thank you so much for all this. And to answer your initial question about encouraging the employees uh, and the personnel you know, carrying out the, the operations of the petroleum outfits, the free market would take its course, we would hope, and those folks would maybe adapt. But, um, the other complex set of questions that you've, that you've offered will hopefully be answered in the next two years by the, by the, 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 the folks who uh, are, you know, the, the council that was the, the uh, study committee that, that this policy created. Is there a spot to like, keep up to date? With yes, you? okay, that's great. Like, so that's before, you, before you leave, I will hope to get your email and your phone number so that you can be plugged into the, the public hearings. There'll be a series of them across the state. Um, okay. We'd love to get <laughs> your, Thoughts in those times. So another critical piece to this puzzle is child care. Um, this housing, yes, jobs, yes, child care. All of those are just intertwined. What is the? Uh, I know that the whole the veto process, the child care initiatives were also part of that veto process. What do you foresee happening? and what do you see were the most important parts of what actually got passed? I, I see us overriding that veto and having that bill go fully into effect. Sure. 
any bill that comes up on the override session will be overridden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And relating to the child care um, uh, package that was passed, what parts do you well, feel I'll, were really important to get done? I'll tell you, in the final weeks of the legislative session, uh, th there were rumors that that bill, that huge bill, um, the big one, really the biggest, aside from the housing bill, um, was dead. That was false. I mean, I don't know where it came from, but sometimes in the state house, rumors, you know, arise. They manifest themselves, and then you chase that rumor around the building until you find out that was never true. And it turns out that the Senate and the House disagreed on where exactly we would cultivate the revenue to fund the program that we foresee, uh, payroll tax versus income tax. I was very pleased to see that the Senate got their way on having a payroll tax because that's less burdensome to, that's, that impacts fewer, you know, it's, it's, it's not gonna be so burdensome to, to more people than fewer, you know, it's, 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 I think that's a better way to fund it. But the components that you feel were important get past or what? Well, it's going to um, make it more attractive to be a child care worker because wage it will subsidize wages. And it's also going to subsidize um, households who have small children to be able to put their children in, um, in daycare and to have child care. They're going to, they're, it's going to, right now there are certain subsidies in place. And they're going to be greatly expanded with this bill. So it will be affordable to a, a much bigger percentage of the population than it is right now. Well, for example, will the Brookfield School end up offering um, full-time programming for three and four-year-olds? Is that part of what is going to happen here? I don't, I mean, know, that, I don't know specifically about, about Brookfield. That is the intent of the bill. Okay, that's, that's where the that's kind of the overall decision about the location of the primary location of the child, a state supported child. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that, yes, you could probably expect that. We've discovered that the child care sector in Vermont, uh, we need both private and public sector, as you know. The, the impetus that the legislature has had to take responsibility for is the reality that the onus is on the taxpayers to have to invest in the public sector heavily. Kevin? Uh, this is a little bit of a follow up, but it encompasses a lot of what both of you have said. So, and I know, Larry, that Mark greatly appreciates. I talked to Mark McDonald as well. He's upset he couldn't be here. He wanted to talk about the competing situation. I think you've done an elegant job of trying to describe it. I just ran some numbers in my head because I have some familiarity with this. I think you might have saved over $3,000 this year. It's because we're complicated. Everything is so complicated than it used to be. We've just burned wood for oil. There's no easy answers to that. If I have an 1824 house, I cannot use heat pumps well, lots of small rooms. But I went to a um, pellet stove. I have wood heat. I was heating wood as well. Pellet stove, which I just did ran some numbers here again, saved me over three thousand dollars in my home last year, because I saved over twelve hundred dollars. Well, just just because, like you, I can only have to run the oil at fifteen or twenty below. The pellet stove and the wood stove between them saved me a lot of money. So that, that's just one piece of the puzzle. I want to get back to um, economics a little bit. I know both of you are not, and that's but but this gentleman and others have said it's getting more hard for young people to stay here in the state. It, and, and I have two children as well now, young 20s, middle 20s. One's already left, another one's just in his college, I think he's going to move out. Um, and it's because of the cost of living. It's housing and other costs of living. We're losing a lot of young people that way. I, and I have a question that relates to that. Are tax rates still in our towns here are equal or going up this year? Now, my understanding is in the state of Maine, they reframed that using the federal emergency money that was flooded into the states. 
I've read different things, including out of the House right now, where people stated, all that federal money's dried out and almost done. That, that's not true. There, there are still tens of millions of dollars sitting in the coffers in Vermont right now. Education is one of them, by the way. It's huge. So I guess my question is, I don't think that there was a correlation between the federal dollars and what you were trying to do to hold the budget in line as House and Senate members this year. Um, Maine, I think, took a stance, we can look it up, I might be wrong, but they tried to take a stance of, because of all the federal influx, no property increases. Now I'm understanding that our, our tax rate is going to go down slightly for education, but because the revaluation of Vermont homes, which has exploded, okay. is going to cost people even more. So I'm wondering what types of things, and I know this is not on YouTube, gentlemen, per se, <laughs> but no, it is a situation, and I, I want to know if people talk about it in the House and Senate. And if they had an understanding from education and other agencies, just how much money towns had, et cetera. In, in Maine, they took the money, and you can't offset taxes with it, but they put programs out early for citizens to vote on that would offset costs they had to pay. And we didn't do that here. We just kept saying it costs more to educate kids, we have to spend more money. Right. And, and the schools and everything, there was no conversation that there was $350 million in state re extra state revenue sitting here to be spent, which is now we're spending out a contract. We are just forcing, force feeding money out of here to spend yeah. on almost anything, not necessarily preschool or children's education. We're building construction projects. The costs are off the roof because people, we don't have enough workers. They can charge, they're coming in from New Hampshire, they can charge what they want them. I'll shut up there. I hope I made a point though. Yeah. It is. You did. Is there a question though? I think the question is, do you see anything involved with any of the programs you've discussed, mm -hmm. child care, education, the heating situation, whatever, that can also work back and we can talk to each other better, including federal people, sure. which obviously are not talking to state people well, to make sure that Vermont is getting this bang for all the bucks we have. In education, you mean? Yeah, in education, so, by, by primary. By, by Kevin, you know probably better than most of the members of the audience, how our education, our public education system is funded in Vermont. It's very complicated. Uh, you just referred to the common level of appraisal being something that will rise, despite the fact that we are likely to see maybe three or four cents relief in our uh, property tax value in these towns, Randolph, Brookfield, surrounding towns, you know, this district. The cost per pupil uh, each year does indeed increase just about no matter what. Um, and the idea that we should spend less or save money on education is not a, a great one to pursue. Um, I guess if you're asking, can we figure out ways to better leverage federal dollars and be more in, in closer communication with the federal government. I imagine there are opportunities for that, but um, if, for as long as it's so <laughs> I mean, I think what part of the question is, did you guys know that? I'm not trying to put it on Do you spot, know I why? I think the average representative. Do you know what, do you want to, so this is, my, this, this may be just my opinion, but I imagine most of you might agree with me. The reason why we have the education funding formula that we have today, those two things, but additional to that is the concept of local control, which is entirely a myth in Vermont. It, isn't. it is It is a concept that isn't real. And the reason is because you're not in control of a budget that only you can have an opportunity to say no to. So you're, the voters of Brookfield get to vote no to the budget that would you know, prop up Randolph High School. And that's it. And if you succeed in, in, in collectively saying, no, we reject that budget, and the other towns that belong to that district do the same, then it's upon the school board and the superintendent and those who create the budget to come back with a new proposal, which <coughs> theoretically would be a, 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 a lower dollar amount than the one that you rejected. <coughs> Is that control? No. It's veto power, at best, tops. You, know, you guys know all about that. Well, I was on the House Education Committee for two terms, so I did, so I, I got, so the last two sessions prior to the one that we've just served, uh, we, we explored what it will look like to update 
the variables by which we determine the cost per pupil in a, in a high school like Grand Island. What, it, what, are the very, what are the factors that we calculate to determine how expensive it is to educate one child in 10th grade versus one child in 2nd grade? Um, there used to be about four or five variables. Now there are eight, maybe nine. Um, that policy is being ironed out. You know, the, the updated per pupil weighting system, weighting being W E I G H T. Um, we have yet to see what the impact would be, but um, I guess to, to if you had if your question was <laughs> what is your, your question was can, are we doing are we looking into that we certainly have and uh, that was a that was a controversial topic this session most of the topics in the education committees were social in nature. Um, we let the court system typically in Vermont. Uh, in Vermont, we lawmakers let the courts decide what policy ought to, what criteria ought to dictate policy on those matters. Yeah, of course. So like, for example, whether or not public dollars ought to go to religious institutions, or independent schools versus public, you know, all the different categories of schools and, and what regulatory rules they should be bound by versus what they should benefit it's from. It's legal and respectable. Sure. Per pupil thing comes up every year. You probably work with Andrew Stone, public tax. Sure. Yeah. I know who he is. Sure. So, so, so I, I'm well aware of how the formula works. Right, right. So, the, so the, the update to the formula passed last session. We don't have to dig into that probably for another year or two. Mm -hmm. But it will be another yeah. several years. Until a new tax bill comes. Got it. So the new appraisal goes up, which is what this gentleman was referring to. Right, right. And the cost of everything every year goes up. Well, and of course, especially, uh, you know, expenses like, you know, our legislature. They need to double their way, uh, you know, new, new money. The legislative compensation bill? Yeah. That came out of my committee. And, I want my money back. What's that? I want my money back. You want your money back? Well, Jack, you'll be, you'll be pleased to know that I voted against it, selfishly. And I, though I have no qualms with the contents of the policy, I, I agree with the philosophy. I, I really think you guys really look at yourself more like state employees than you are elected officials, and it's bogus. That could be the case for some. It's not the case for me. I can only speak for myself. Well, I get that. You're, you have a different family background, too, Jay, so you know, That's true. it goes along with Similar criteria. Very true. So we have to go along. We're going to time this. We're going to time this now. This, go is, ahead. this is a Q and A. Uh, I appreciate your saying. Anybody on that side of the room have a question? Because I think we're wrapping up at eight thirty, right? Hey, hey. So we have a couple times, and I want to note that the right side has been, you know, a little less with questions. So I want to encourage you to have questions. The right side of the brain, right? <laughs> Well, there are more people on this side. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but you have to, you have to borderline there. Shall we turn that way? It's a more substantial question, but I'm just curious if you've heard what the status of the cannabis bill is. Last time it hadn't been signed, hadn't been gotten yet. Oh, that's true. It hasn't yet. Cannabis. Um, I imagine the governor will let that one go into into law without touching it. Yeah. And what's that bill so big? Uh, it's, there were some updates to the, the regulations, mostly. And, yeah, we'll continue. So we do. So every committee, every session does housekeeping, and what we do is we take in you know, the stakeholders of the, of the various industries that we're trying to regulate or decide how to, and they'll come and tell us what's working, what's not working. Um, in this case, we got feedback uh, from that community and, and also from the Cannabis Control Board, and we'll continue to do that for the coming years, every year. In my committee, I'll, so I'm the guy to call. And I wonder if before we wrap up, I also respond to Kevin's question, because um, I, I think he, it's a really important question. And that, um, <clears throat> I guess I, I'd have a couple of different responses. And one is that, um, yes, Vermont got a, a tremendous amount of money from the federal government, and um, and that money is 
is being spent over several years. So, and it's a choice, you know, like you said, you know, different states have managed their budgets in different ways, um, depending upon what, what their priorities are. Um, we talked about housing and, and the urgent need for more affordable, more and more affordable housing. Um, Vermont is going to be spending hundreds of millions of dollars on housing projects um, using a, a lot of that money over the next several years. So a lot of that money, yeah, I mean, I suppose there, there's a world in which we could have chosen to not spend that money on housing and instead to lower taxes. Um, that's, that's a pretty tough call, I think, you know, like, you know, we, it's, it, the housing piece is so critical. I mean, I, I think that it is the right decision to spend that money on housing. I, I, it's such an urgent need. We, we heard from peaks, people who I completely agree with that, you know, if, if housing costs continue to rise, even if they just stay the where they are, um, we're at risk of, you know, really destabilizing out the structure of our society here, our local in Vermont. Um, huge problem, um, worth spending money on. And then, you know, the other big piece of this is, you know, when we talk about budgetary issues, we always talk about the costs. They're very present in our minds with, for very good reasons. We don't often talk as much about what we get for those costs. And, you know, one of the things that we're going to spend a lot of money on in the next few years, assuming we override the governor's veto on the child care bill, True. is on child care. We're going to spend a lot of money. It's many millions of dollars. People are going to pay it out of their taxes. But, you know, Many studies over many, many years are very, very clear. Every dollar we put into this early childhood education, we get back all that money and a lot more. So I think it's really important for us to flip things on their head and sometimes think not so much what is the cost of doing something, but what's the cost of not doing it, right? Because right now, we're paying the costs of not investing in our children and not doing some of the things which we ought to be doing. Of course there's limits. We can only afford so much. But we do always need to keep in mind that sometimes it pays to make that extra effort, come up with the extra money, so that we can benefit from that and make our society richer over time. Can I just say, we're at 8.30, so I'm just trying to be careful. Get, from the guy. And, and Kevin had one quick, oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Kevin had one update. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, yeah. clarify the 30 for 15. 30, 30 by 30. 30, 30 by 30. Yeah. Uh, um, and I was curious if that's uh, federally protected land. Is that going to be like purchased uh, from private landowners, or is that like a. Do you know the answer? Because I think I, I do, but I think you know better. So, yeah. So <clears throat> there's a global initiative that's 30 by 30. And it is now also a federal initiative that was endorsed by President Biden not too long ago. <clears throat> Vermont right now has a, a, a combination of public and private land. Um, we have a big chunk of public land that is our national forests. State also owns lands, municipalities own lands, so there's a fair amount of public land also. <clears throat> there's quite a bit of private land which is already um, permanently protected through land trusts. What this bill specifically does for Vermont is it helps us figure out how to get the rest of the way there. So right now, <clears throat> it depends upon how you measure it, but we're somewhere in the low 20s in terms of the percentage of land which is already permanently protected in Vermont. So if we want to get to 30%, we're like most of the way there already. <clears throat> How do we get there? That's the open question. And like a lot of bills, especially the more complex ones that, per, per, that appear before the legislature, one of the things that I think a lot of people don't really <clears throat> know about is that the expertise in, in, in our legal structures, in our state government, really is in the state agencies. It's not really in the legislature. We have a citizen leg legislature that meets for a little less than five months a year. We're really 
a bunch of part-timers, right? And we have no staff. So nobody works for me. I'm it in terms of research, responding to constituents, reading my email. No one helps me do any of that stuff. And so if we want to do things which really require a lot of legwork in Vermont, I'm talking about state government, it's usually the state agencies that do that heavy lifting. So this, what this bill does is it directs the Agency of Natural Resources, being assisted by the Housing Conservation Board, to basically do an inventory, a much more detailed inventory than we have, than we have now, of what currently exists and its land ownership status, and then say, OK, we're here. We want to get here in this amount of time. What are some possibilities for getting there? And that's really all this bill does. It's really a baby step. It's not actually appropriating money to purchase land. It doesn't lay out a prescriptive way to get us there. It's basically saying, what's the world of possibilities? What opportunities do we have? What's the best way to do this in a prioritized way, too? Like We don't want to just protect any land. Right? There's certain places which are much lower priority and such places which are much higher priority. How do we actually go about preserving the land which is going to make the most impact, which is going to give us the greatest bang for our buck as we talk about going through that process. And it doesn't force anybody to sell the land. It doesn't force anybody to do anything. But it creates opportunity for people Just, to do that. Yep. Yeah. It doesn't force anybody to do anything. Can I answer your question? Thanks, Thanks. So it's 8.30. Thank you. Kevin had a very quick update on the wastewater. Yeah. 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 So government, I'll just write and read this from when I got back. So, and, 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 and people not like hearing all this, but something like right. Government is always easy to blame. There are conservative standards, but a fully compliant system is essential. It will last. It will not produce pollution and other persons' groundwater. Real estate brokers are the real culprit here, if people are upset, because they are the ones who forced the state to run the program and took it away from the towns, who were doing a, quote, crappy job. Pardon the pun, they put something else there, actually. <laughs> and there were lots of failures. It was becoming a legal nightmare. So there's a lot of breakdown. And the other person, the other technician added, soils are very wet. This is not going to make people feel happy either. Microbes don't break down. Waste and cheap systems have continually failed in Vermont if they're not properly engineered. And they did agree with the person who said that we should look into, because I said there were costs. People were complaining about the cost. We should look into how to manufacture and use technology. Like some of you have suggested to bring the cost down for the, for the piping system. So, I think it's a dialogue. And if I can say one thing else, communication, we have computers and we have phones. We do. Communication is the worst thing. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit older. Communicate better with Pandemic the government. Impact. It, 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 so I, I can give a couple of quick examples. I, I didn't ask my question to put the guys in the spot if you're doing good work. Thank I asked the question because it's amazing to me that we get so many hundreds of billion dollars of federal money. And people, I call people to state house and senators, and they don't even know it exists. Right, right. And, they're, and they're doing their work, and they're doing it diligently, but they don't know it exists. And I'll give one other example. It's very close to home for me. If people know Randolph Center, the State Environmental Lab, which was built not following Act 250. I have asked repeatedly for people. Alf Lloyd and I know that we've just given up. We sure. wrote letters. I wrote a letter to state government about why they built it 60 feet taller than they had a permit to do. I was supposed yeah. to see apple trees in my historic house. And I see a factory that's so loud at night, with windows closed, you can hear it. All I hear is we're working. We have a sound mitigation plan. It's the latest I've heard that. Nobody, BGS doesn't talk to the state government, doesn't talk to the federal government, doesn't talk to DTC that they bought the land from for a buck. Nobody talks to anyone. And it is amazing to me that how, with all the equipment we've got, and everyone like you and every one of us working so hard, that there's such missing stuff going on. Yeah. OK? Yeah. I'll ask you guys later about the bottom bill, because I come from Maine, and they've solved their bottom bill. So we're, we're going to leave yeah. it there. Yeah. 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 Questions to the candidates. Later, right? Questions to the candidates, can you can preform, communicate with them here. I'm not so, so. having a dialogue at the back. Eventually, I'll sign it, but it would be nice to see people help stack the chairs on the sides. Right. Tomorrow night, Geo, if you want to come for the first time. <laughs>